Uh, good morning, Grace Gospel Church family. It is just so good to be with you, brothers and sisters. Uh, some of you uh, I, I know me, have known me for 20 or more years, um, but there are a lot of uh, new faces here today. But Kyoko and I and our boys are really happy to be here. Um, it's been a few years, uh, but we're always excited to come back home. As some of you know, my home is actually Bayport. That's where I grew up. Um, born in Bayshore Hospital, so this is really, really home for me. Um, but I want to thank you for uh, believing and loving, uh, believing in and loving our family. And we, we get birthday cards for every birthday in our family, and we are so thankful for that. Um, and we are just thankful for your prayers and, and your support. I mean, is the PowerPoint on? I, I noticed that before. Do I have to? Okay. Sorry about that. This is our family. Um, and uh, I want to thank you also for caring about bringing Japanese into relationship with Jesus. It's all about uh, coming into a relationship with him. We thank you for giving generously, for praying faithfully, regularly for God's kingdom work in the country of Japan. This is a picture of Hiroshima, our family by the atomic bomb dome, as well as the uh, it's a fairly large city of over a million people and a beautiful scene in the uh, inland sea of Hiroshima um, in the corner. Uh, but we want to thank you for walking with our family for many uh, years so far. Um, it has been uh, a lot of years and, and we're just so grateful for uh, your support of us. Um, do you know it's already been five and a half years since we moved to Hiroshima with Pioneers? 16 since we moved to Japan, but it's already five and a half years since we moved to, to Hiroshima and we, ex we changed missions to Pioneers. And I want to just uh, show you our boys here. Uh, some of you may remember they were little babies practically uh, a few years ago, but now they're very active um, in the outdoors, baseball. Uh, the, the picture on the right, um, the right hand corner is field hockey. Uh, each of the boys are playing field hockey at the moment. Um, and Andrew's uh, a pretty fast runner, even though he doesn't practice. <laughs> but he was leading the pack in that race without taking a breath. Um, so the guys are really growing up. Um, they also love reading books. Um, they love growing in Jesus and serving with us in ministry. And uh, here's a picture um, of, of some of the ministry that we have, that they've been part of in Hiroshima. Uh, we're very proud of them, and we consider ourselves to be a missionary family, so we hope you'll take time to chat with our boys. Um, they might be a little shy, uh, but uh, please, please take time to interact with them. I want to give Kyoko a lot of credit, too, for diligently homeschooling the children for many years and she's an amazing support for me in personal ministry and team leadership um, and reaching Japanese. And she's translated for me on numerous, numerous occasions uh, as I've been giving messages in Japan. But God has done so much. And I want to give you a little context because some of you are new and some of, a lot has happened in five and a half years. So it's a bit of an update and I want to give you perspective because I'm really excited about what God's done but I'm going to say this right off. It was the hardest five years of my life, of our life, probably as a family. But it was the best five years of our life. And I'll try to explain that as I go through and even as I share the message. But it has, it has not been easy at all. But God has sustained us. We've seen his grace in the midst of difficulty and challenges that have come upon us. So here's, where, here's a little overview of the five and a half years. So five and a half years ago, God called us out of crew, Campus Crusade, which I was part for 30 years, and we were in Tokyo, and he called us to, pi with, to Pioneer's Ministry in Hiroshima. So we joined a, team, a church planting team, brand new church planters. Uh, we're, we know a lot about student ministry, but it was our first time to uh, be involved with church planting. So we joined the team five and a half years uh, ago as members, and six weeks after that, we were taken aside and uh, asked if, if we would take the leadership of the team. So we've been leading the team for practically all of the last five years. 
And through a process of divine subtraction, eight of the original people left the team, but, and many new additions, we have a completely new and wonderful team now that we're very, very grateful for. And these are the brand new, as of about a year and a half ago, team members. It's a completely new team. The Boyle family in the left top, Young from New Zealand, she's Korean, and she's, uh, she joined our team uh, uh, from New Zealand, and uh, our, our whole team uh, in the left-hand corner, lower corner. Uh, you can see Art, he's the big guy, he's a bodybuilder. We, we, he, he is literally the strongest man in Hiroshima. Um, out, of, out of three million people, I, I seriously do not doubt it. Um, but God is using him in, uh, in a lot of neat ways in ministry. Um, and, and all of these people. So when you're praying for us as a family, you're praying for us as a family, but you're also praying for our leadership and our investment in these people and many, many, many more to come and in partnership. So God is working through us personally, but he's also working through our team. Uh, five and a half years ago, we had no church planning experience, as I said, but now we're practically, I guess you could say, veterans of church planning partnership having been thrown into team leading a church planning team five years ago. Um, our ministry before was narrowly campus, but now uh, we are multiplying disciples to Christ Church. And um, this is the larger church of, in Hiroshima on the top uh, when we put all the three or four chapels together uh, for an annual uh, worship service. And then uh, on the bottom is a, ch a church planting training uh, that we hosted in Hiroshima. Um, we used to focus a lot on outreach programs, and I do believe in programs, but now our ministry really is very simply and wholeheartedly people. That's what it's all about. I mean, programs, events, all the things that we could come up with in our own minds, are, are, are many of them are good. They're God-given, but it's all about the people, and we love to simply minister to people in, in Hiroshima, and, and here are just the some of those people um, that we've been ministering to. Uh, five and a half years ago, uh, I used to be shy about preaching. I do not consider myself uh, overly confident in this role, but now in the last uh, five and a half years, I've given well over 50 or more messages, different messages on numerous occasions, and even God has allowed me to preach in Japanese finally after 16 years in Japan. So I'm really thankful for that. And the, the Japanese people, by the way, were um, really encouraged when I could give the message in Japanese. Um, I don't think it's nearly perfect. Um, my English message is going to be far more perfect in terms of words or communication, but the heart, they said, comes out in Japanese. And so I, I want to do a lot more preaching in Japanese in, Jap in Japan. Um, and I think God's enabling me to enter into that new season. So five and a half years ago, you know that my dad was very much alive. Um, I even came back here in 2015 to help uh, mom and dad move out of Riverhead. And uh, it wasn't long after that that the, the Lord took him home. And he's been with Jesus now for nearly about four years. Um, I, by the way, am the new family patriarch. Um, and you might notice my bald head and my graying beard are uh, indicators of my patriarchal role in my family. Um, through many unexpected changes, God has brought us, our family, into a new season of growth that we're really excited about. And um, again, we can't tell you how much we love our team. Our team in Japan uh, is not a team, really. It's a family. That's really what we are, and that's what I consider you as well. It's not a congregation, you're a family. Um, and, and that's the way the body of Christ should be. We love our partnership with Japanese pastors. Um, the, the, the young man on the right there is, is, a, is a pastor. He's actually, he's been pastoring for more than 20 years, so he's, he's not so young anymore. But um, anyway, uh, we, we partner with Japanese pastors. Um, we love mentoring and discipleship relationships with Japanese, um, and uh, we are uh, um, we also love sending out laborers. Um, and this is a, a, at our bilingual church plant. Um, and at, in this particular photo, I'm 
uh, praying over uh, four people that we're sending out from the church uh, to be um, to serve him in other places. Uh, so that's been a part of what we've been able to do is to send forth, forth laborers into the global harvest. Um, we, we also uh, love the open doors that God is giving us. And one of those is now sharing Jesus with children, and Kyoko has been very instrumental in that. Um, we also reach out to high school and university students, uh, though not quite as regularly as we could five and a half years ago. But as we're leading our church, as we're partnering with Japanese, this is a part of what we're doing, is reaching out to the students on the campuses. Um, we also love starting uh, men's group. This is a men's group that, that I've been able to be a part of. It's uh, about half and half Japanese and foreigners. Um, Kyoko also has started uh, some Bible study groups. Um, and we also are, are in Kyoko's hometown. And so her mom and dad, this is Masahiro uh, on the, uh, the left and Seiko on the right. Uh, Kyoko's mom and dad, um, they're both getting close to about around 80 years old. Uh, but they are not yet believers, but we are so thankful to be near them uh, because we've been able to have a lot of significant relationship with them. Um, so please pray. When you pray for our family, pray for Kyoko's mom and dad as well uh, to know Jesus. Actually, Kyoko is the only family member in her whole lineage uh, that we know of who is a believer in Jesus. So we're praying for more, another and another and another um, in her family. Um, we also are uh, really happy and excited to, to see that God has brought at least a few Japanese into his kingdom. And here is Akari, who was baptized uh, maybe two years ago. Enna, uh, a little girl who came to know Jesus a few years ago uh, with Kyoko in, her Bible, uh, in a Sunday school class. Boo uh, came to know Christ through Young's influence, um, actually, at uh, a language school. Um, he's actually Chinese. But uh, God has enabled us to reach internationally as well. And Sanai actually is a long, long story to that, which I won't tell you. But you can ask Kyoko about it. Because Kyoko has known Sanai for um, how many years here? 25? 25, 25 almost, uh, maybe even more. Um, she's known uh, Sanai probably for more than 30 years. And uh, they went to uh, junior college together. Um, but she came to know Christ. And uh, it's just... That's an amazing story, so I, I, I wish you would ask Kyoko about that one. Um, so reflecting on all that our faithful God has done, we really have nothing but hope for the next decade and beyond. Um, truly, we have hope. So just uh, a little bit about our, our uh, mission. Um, our mission in Hiroshima is to be a disciple, to multiply disciples. And in our discipleship, God has called us to three guiding essentials. So the, fir uh, the first one being uh, pray. To li life and ministry fueled by prayer and loving relationship with the Father. It's all about our upward relationship with our Heavenly Father. Love is Christian community motivated by love and sharing Christ with a broken world. And, and that's all about our, our outreach. It's also about the way we love one another. Send is the third part. Every believer equipped and sent to transform Hiroshima, Japan, and the whole world. This is our local mission, our local guiding uh, principles um, that, uh, for Hiroshima team that I lead. Um, our 2025 vision, um, I do want you to pray ahead because we have, a, God has given us a, a dream for Hiroshima, and so we have a five-year dream um, by which we would establish our bilingual church plan as a cell church model, that there would be many cell church small groups making up the, cell, the, the, the church itself that would transform Hiroshima, bless Japan, and touch the nations. Um, Ten years out, in t by 2030, we're praying that there would actually be networks of these reproducing cell groups, that Japanese would uh, be raised up in Christ, they would be baptized, um, they would be nurtured and equipped, that the Japanese would actually lead the church in mission. Um, Upon our return to, Hir uh, to Hiroshima in January, we'd like you to pray for these things. Um, so please keep these in, in mind. Uh, pray for more cell groups to organically form and to grow and to multiply. We believe this is the key to what God wants to do, not big gatherings as much as cell groups. 
uh, for pray for uh, networks of cell groups um, that would gather as churches for worship, biblical teaching, great commission, vision, testimony, and koinonia community. Um, we ask that you would pray for three missionary pastor teams. Right now, uh, we only really have one small team, as you saw in the picture, but we're praying for 20 workers in the next five years that will enable us to raise up uh, missionary pastor teams, uh, a foreign missionary Japanese pastor working together to plant three uh, new churches in the next 10 years. Um, and so, again, pray for three new cell churches launched by 2030. Um, for those of you that have the faith to pray, and which I'm doing, I'm praying, God, you work in the next 50 years as well. So if you, ha if you can pray for even longer term, um, by 2045, Hiroshima will have experienced the 100th anniversary of the atomic bomb. And so we are praying for an absolute widespread transformation uh, by the gospel of the city of Hiroshima. Um, long, long, long way to go, but by 2045, by the 100th anniversary, that God, that God would move, that his Holy Spirit would move and transform this city. Um, I'll be 81, by the way, on that day if God gives me breath. <laughs> um, but my kids will be, um, will be in, in uh, the middle generation by that point, adults. Um, by 2070, 50 years from now, um, pray that God would make Japan a missionary sending nation. Right now, all the missionaries are coming to Japan. Very few are going out from Japan. But I'm praying that by 2070, that's 50 years from now, that Japan would become a missionary sending nation, that God would do the same that he's done in Korea to make Korea a missionary sending nation so there would be far more missionaries going out from Japan than coming to Japan. Um, and only God can do that. Um, I'm convinced that we can sow gospel seeds more broadly. We can evangelize more effectively. We can pursue seekers more faithfully. We can make disciples more diligently, and I really believe we should do all this. We can build beautiful, healthy-looking churches, but only a supernatural visit of the Holy Spirit can spark a church planting movement. Only, only God can do it. And so when we're praying these things, we're not praying for human intervention. We're pray, praying for God's intervention. So as our team faithfully works towards multiplying churches in Japanese soil, um, pray that we'll live with prayer and dependence on God as our absolute highest priority. Um, so that's a, a, a really whirlwind tour of, of our min, uh, ministry, uh, our vision, our family, and I'd like to take the remaining time and look at Philippians 3 this morning. And I believe that God has a message for us from Philippians 3. Uh, and then I'm also going to share some other significant scriptures um, in my life from the recent years. So in, uh, I'm going to divide Philippians 3 into three sections. The first is Philippians 3, 1 to 6. And in this passage, we, in, in these scriptures, we see the constant upward gaze of a devoted disciple of Jesus. It's constantly looking to God for everything, as a source of everything, not looking to man, not looking within, but looking to God alone. The upward gaze of a devoted disciple of Jesus. And this is not a devoted disciple versus a normal disciple. We're all supposed to be, God has called us all to be devoted disciples of Jesus, to be all his, all the time. And so I want to read what the Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Philippi. Finally, my brothers, Rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice is an upward gaze. Rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble to me and is safe for you. Look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. For you were the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God. There's, again, the upward look. Worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus. Not glory in man's work, but glory in Christ Jesus. It's the upward gaze. And put no confidence in the flesh. No confidence in the flesh. And Paul said, though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also, 
If anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Paul was circumcised on the eighth day of the... Uh, uh, he was of the people of Israel. He was of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. As to the law, a Pharisee. As to zeal, a persecutor of the church. As to righteousness under the law, he was blameless. You see, Paul had more reason than any of us in this room to put confidence in himself. He could have put confidence in himself, and yet he taught us, and he lived a life that constantly looked upward to God, and he rejoiced in him. He rejoiced not in his, cir in, in his circumstances necessarily, but that God, he rejoiced in the God who allowed him to be in the circumstances he was in for the sake of Jesus. He, Paul said, he taught us to worship by the Spirit of God again, to worship by the Spirit of God, to glory in Christ Jesus. And I can't say it enough, but to put no confidence in the flesh. No confidence in the flesh. And that means no confidence in the flesh, not a little bit. This is similar to what Jesus taught in John 15, 5 and 7. Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. And here he says, Jesus says the same thing as Paul said, really. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Apart from Jesus, we can do nothing. If you abide in me, Jesus said, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. And so the longer I live as a disciple of Jesus, the more I realize that I can do nothing without him. I wish I knew this 30, 35 years ago when I gave my life to Jesus. Um, I thought I was something. A and over the course of the years, there's always seasons in which I feel like I'm something. There's something I can do, something that God could use me for. But really, without him, I can do nothing. Um, and that's the place we need to be, is knowing that without him, we can do nothing. It causes us to lean on him. Jesus is everything. He abides in me, as he says, but I'm learning to abide in him. He abides in me, but it's a very long learning process to abide in him. He says I can ask anything I wish and it'll be done for me. So I'm learning to pray more and fret less. To pray more and fret less. Does anybody have a fretting life? Anxious, stressed, afraid, worried, conflict. <laughs> we all have these kinds of lives. And I'm learning something from Philippians 4, 6, the next uh, slide. Paul said, do not be anxious, do not fret about anything. About anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. This is really very simple but profound advice. When you're anxious, when you're fretting, pray. That's the trigger. You're feeling anxious, you're fretting, you're feeling fear, you're feeling stress. Those are all triggers that are gifts from God to cause us to look upward and pray and say, God, we need you. I need you. When it's all going smooth and uh, soft and gentle and the calm seas, we don't tend to feel a great need to look upward and to call upon Jesus and to even worship him, quite honestly. Uh, but these are triggers that cause us to look upward and pray. And Jesus invites uh, every one of us in Matthew 11, 28 to 30, he says, Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. It's not just body rest. It's not just emotional mind rest. It's just rest for your soul in the deepest places. Jesus says, For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. One great key to Christian discipleship is this constant upward look to Jesus. And when we do so, this is where we bear much fruit. 
And this is where we find rest for our souls. And don't we all want to bear fruit for the kingdom, for Jesus? Of course we do, but it's only through him. Don't we want to find rest for our souls? I mean, that's what every human being is looking for, is some kind of place of peace, of satisfaction, of purpose, of rest in, um, in the hands of someone or something bigger than them. And in our case, we know that God holds us in his hand and we find rest for our souls in him. And even in the midst of, cons- of life storms and chaos. Um, the second uh, section of Philippians 3, which is verses 7 to 11, Points, uh, t- teaches us that we, we see the constant outward overflow of a loving disciple of Jesus. And I'm going to read uh, verses 7 to 11. But whatever gain I had, Paul said, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of of all things and I count them as rubbish as manure in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law but that which comes through faith in Christ the righteousness from God that depends on faith and Paul says in verse 10 that I may know him Jesus and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. So Paul longed for intimacy with Jesus, and he longed for the resurrected life. But he knew that these things required the suffering of the the loss of all things for the sake of Christ. He knew and faithfully lived some things that I'm only beginning to understand through some of the dark days that we've had in the last five years, that to attain the resurrection, which is what we all want, do we all want the resurrected life? Every day, every moment, living resurrected in Jesus, walking with him in intimacy. That's what we all want. But we must, Paul teaches us that we must share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. Who wants that? Who wants to share the sufferings of Christ? If you think about what Christ suffered, who wants to suffer and to experience something, anything like Christ's death on the cross for us? I don't know anyone, myself included, who has the natural inclination to want any of that. But Paul's, our human nature and society teach us over and over again the comfortable life, the good life, to avoid loss, to avoid suffering, and to avoid by all means death. To avoid all that, to avoid the pain. That's what the world teaches us. That's what society teaches us. But Paul teaches us that these are the things, the losses, the suffering, the death, the loss of my father, the death of of so much around me in Hiroshima, the complete overturn of a team, These are all the things that actually unlock the resurrected life. It's through the sufferings, it's through many tribulations that we experience the kingdom of God, that we experience the resurrected life. And this is similar to what um, uh, Jesus taught us in Mark 8, 34 and 35. Jesus said, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily, it says, in uh, another of the Gospels, and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the Gospels will save it. We all want to save our life, don't we? But the path to saving our life is for losing our life. And that's the part that we struggle with. But that's that's what Jesus, that's what Paul taught. This is what we're called to, is to losing our life, whatever that means, for us personally, God's calling on our life for the sake, for his sake. When was the last time you prayed for your life to be lost in love for another soul? Your life to be lost in love for another soul. But this is the ticket to the resurrected life in Jesus. 
One of my favorite scriptures recently, Isaiah 50, verses 4 and 5, explains a little how this works. The Lord has given me the tongue of disciples that I may know how to sustain the weary one with a word. He awakens me morning by morning. He awakens my ear to listen as a disciple. The Lord has opened my ear, and I was not disobedient, nor, nor, nor did I turn back. You see, we get, when we get too focused on ourselves, we need God, desperately need Him to awaken our ear to listen as a disciple. God, help me to hear your voice. Through morning prayer, God graces us then with a loving word to sustain the weary one. There's many people weary around us. Sometimes we're the weary one. And we need that word desperately from God himself, so we need to listen. And when we listen as a disciple, he gives us the word of a disciple to be a blessing to the people around us. The Lord, it says, the Lord God has opened my ear. It's him, he is the one who opens our ear. And I was not disobedient, nor did I turn back. And so, when God tells us what to do, we must not be disobedient, nor should we turn back. We must be ready to listen to him and to speak his word, his loving word to others, to sustain the weary people around us. And what Jesus says in John 7, he says that if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. That's what the world needs. They don't need more of us. They need rivers of living water flowing through us, but we don't have anything to give. We don't have river, uh, rivers of living waters in our flesh. We only have rivers of law, living water if we've come to him thirsty to drink. Drinking from Jesus and from his word and from the way that he speaks to us in the morning. He fills us. And, he, and we have something to give to our families. We have something to give to our neighbors. We have something to give to strangers. We have something to give to the people in our life that we really don't like very much, but God loves. We have something to give to these people that God has put around us. And so without Jesus, we have nothing to give. We don't have a word. We don't have a deed to give to anyone. But drinking deeply from our relationship with him we overflow with rivers of living water, and we become a conduit of, for his love to flow to, to the very broken and thirsty world around us. So the third point is going to Philippians 3, down 12 to 21. Um, and we see here the constant inward striving of a heaven-bound disciple of Jesus. Not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect. Paul said he hadn't become all this that we're talking about yet. But I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Christ Jesus has made you his own. Brothers, I do not, cons um, I do not consider, consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do. You know, if there's, Paul was focused. He was really focused. How many of us in this room could say, one thing I do? But Paul said, one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind, and there's a lot of stuff behind us that we ought to just put behind us, and straining forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of, of us who are mature think this way. And if, any, if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. Brothers, join in imitating me and keeping your eyes, keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. For many of whom I have often told you and now tell you even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction, their God is their belly, and they glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. But our citizenship 
Our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. He will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. And so Paul knew that he wasn't there yet. He had a lot of reason to think that he might have been there because we admire Paul. But he knew he wasn't there yet. He was far from perfect, just like all of us. And so he had a very narrow focus for his life, and he strove after one thing only. And a lot of us would do, a, um, it would be a really big turning point in our life if we could say, God, we're striving after one thing only. And God gives us what that one thing is. It's to, it's to, 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 to give everything to him, to surrender everything to him, to press on, as Paul said, toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. So uh, Paul didn't look around to see what everyone else was doing. Okay, I'm going to do what they're doing. I, maybe I should be like them. Paul didn't look around like that. Um, and uh, he didn't compare himself to other people. But he fixed his eyes always on Jesus, knowing that his citizenship was in heaven. So Paul was thirsty for more of God. And he was thirsty for more of heaven. Uh, David in the Old Testament was another one who was thirsty for God. And we'll just, uh, this will be our last scripture, Psalm 63, 1 to 8. It's been one of my favorites for the last, most of the last five and a half years. Let's read what David penned in Psalm 63, 1 to 8. And this is when uh, he was hiding from Saul in the wilderness of Judah. A very, uh, very, very dick, a dark and difficult place that Paul found him, um, that David found himself in, just like Paul found himself in prison. But this is where David penned these words: "O oh God, you are my God; earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you; my flesh faints for you, as a dry, in a dry and weary land where there is no water. In a desert, my soul thirsts for." So I've looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory. Because your steadfast love is better than life, my lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live. In your name, I will lift up my hands. My soul will be satisfied as with fat and rich food, and my mouth will praise you with joyful lips. When I remember you upon my bed, and meditate on you in the watches of the night. You have been my help, Lord, and in the shadow of your wings I will sing for joy. My soul clings to you. Your right hand upholds me. These sound like desperate words, and this should be the normal devoted disciple of Jesus. Should have words of thirsting for God, our soul thirsting, our soul finding satisfaction in him, our soul clinging to God, to have that kind of relationship with him. So David and Paul here, Old Testament, New Testament, they were desperate for one thing. They both said, David also said, one thing I desire of the Lord. Um, and they wanted to be more in love with God. They wanted to be with him for all eternity in heaven, uh, with him in etern for all eternity in heaven. And if we're going to imitate anyone in this life, let's imitate these men after God's own heart. So in uh, a quick summary, and then I'm going to close in prayer, the message today is about being desperate for one thing. To have a constant upward gaze to God. That's where we look. It's the upward gaze toward God. And then it's the constant outward overflow of love towards lost souls. Love that comes from within, that Jesus has put within us. Rivers of living water flowing outward to lost souls. And also, by the way, to our community. Sometimes the hardest people to love are the ones that are close to us. But it's love for those people. And it's a con the thirdly, it's a constant inward striving for more of Jesus and for more of heaven. So let's close.